Today on CityCast Las Vegas, we are celebrating the end of Poetry Month. I'm chatting with former Clark County Poet Laureate Vogue Robinson and longtime Las Vegas writer and poet David Figler, who are also both our hosts, about how much Las Vegas loves poetry and what it takes to build a community in our ever-changing city. It's Wednesday, April 26th. I'm Layla Mohammed, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. All right, Vogue Robinson, David Figler, welcome to your show, City Cast Las Vegas. Hey, my show. <laughs> oh, whose show is it, David? In the spirit of the topic today, salutations, Layla Muhammad. Yes, salutations. We have our wonderful host on today to talk about the end of Poetry Month and poetry in Las Vegas. So my first question for you two who have a storied history in the poetry community in Las Vegas, when it comes to art, and in this case, poetry, is Las Vegas an inspirational city? Why or why not? Vogue, we'll start with you. Oh, I feel I feel honored. <laughs> you better give me these Oprah vibes. <laughs> uh, yes, I definitely think that it's an inspirational city. I think when we talk about juxtaposition, which is one of my like one of my favorite literary devices, but that idea of this sprawling city that's growing right beside this spectacle that is the strip, I think those two things side by side makes you do some compare and contrasting. I love that it's also a valley. So like thinking about like, what is this fertile, like soft space in between all these mountains? Mm. And I think just that that gives it this poetic feel. And then like the beauty of the sunsets yeah. makes everyone pause. I think Vegas actually might turn everyone into poets <laughs> at a certain <laughs> point because that's a, a clear or a core tenet of being a writer is taking the time to observe something and being like, wow, this is amazing with the big things and the small things, if you will. Well, I'm going to defer to Vogue. I mean, after all, she was our Clark County Poet Laureate. I would hope that she would find the city of which she represented inspirational. But yeah, nature, of course, of course, and we're well positioned for that, as Vogue very articulately said. But I also like the city of bombast, the city of spectacle, the city of the human condition experiment on display 24-7, hmm. um, and, and the working class people who service it. And I think that is a rich rich mine in which one can dig a lot of cool poetry. That's really interesting how you guys pointed out two different things. Vogue, you went more for the landscape. David, you went more for the people and the culture. When you both find inspiration in Las Vegas, how does that translate into your poetry? I think it's really in, you'll find that the work ends up being in conversation with other poets because usually I've handed a poem to Sin or I've handed a poem to Jennifer and Jennifer has drawn a line through it and been like, hey, I'm noticing this and this is great, but I really want to know about this part of your relationship with your brother. Like, can you lean into that? So really it's about the writing style. And so mm. the community is in my work. And so, you know, if, if you, if you know, you know, <laughs> you know, but anytime my work is, is better, it's better because of the, the people that I share it with in our community. And you mentioned Sin Atiswe, a very well-known Las Vegas born and bred poet. Um, and we'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, Harry Fagel, who is a number of books of poetry that take place in the streets, sometimes the gritty streets of Las Vegas. The me streets. Right. The me streets of Las Vegas. <laughs> Harry Fagel is our poet who is also a cop <laughs> and was like, was he like police chief? He was a captain. There you go. Yeah. So any, I think we, we embrace that anybody can be a poet. But yeah, how does Vegas show up in your work, David? I used to claim poet a lot more in the 90s than I do these days. And I think hmm. the city itself and how it interacts with people and people interact with me is an endless source of interest, curiosity. That's why I'm doing this podcast. And it's why I write. And that writing has often shown up in a lot of poems. And so I think there's plenty of inspiration here simply because there's always something happening. It's always changing. And sometimes 
parts of it do stay the same and they get forgotten about. And it's fun to write about that too. Nostalgia is a big part of my poetry and writing about times in Las Vegas that don't exist anymore is still something that truly does inspire me. But it's all really part and parcel of just trying to figure out this crazy city of ours. Mm -hmm. And poetry is one means of doing that. I think it's a really lovely medium to try to figure out what the heck the city is really all about. I wonder how inclusive and innovative our poetry scene is. I mean, you mentioned that Harry Fagel is an ex-cop. It sounds like people come from all walks of life to join our poetry community. Yeah, I think Vegas is one of the most interesting towns for poetry because you can find it everywhere. I was surprised to find out there was a poetry bridge in our city where David's poems are at and Bruce Isaacson's work, Fagel's work. Keith Brantley, Andy Hall, I think is on there. Where Where's this bridge? It's downtown just off Las Vegas Boulevard right next to the Fifth Street Schoolhouse. Okay. There's this whole poet bridge area and there's a little water feature and there's some sculpture over there. And it's literally words of poetry that have been etched into the sidewalk. So that one was there when I moved here 10 years ago. And then, of course, like like I thought it was so cool. And then later on, as time passed... Uh, Poetry Promise, which is a nonprofit that Bruce and I started, and we got hit up by the city of Las Vegas and they were like, oh, we want to put more poetry downtown. Can you select poets to be showcased? And I was like, what? This is amazing. And I really I, I almost shied away from it because there's there's got to be a give and take when you have the role as Poet Laureate. Like, yes, you're the spokesperson, but also if every single opportunity to get showcased goes to you, for me, it feels greedy and it feels a little like it's a little slimy. But I basically just gave the entire project up to Bruce and was like, you pick people and I'll be over here minding my business. And he's like, well, we're taking one of your poems. So an excerpt from one of my poems is in the ground. Rodney Lee's work, Rel the Truth. And there was like some drama. There was like drama around that because people were like, oh, those are all performance artists. And it's like, we're all writers first. Like the work starts on the page. And there was a mix of both people who perform more often versus there's the previous bridge had a large group of artists who also primarily wrote so they wanted they wanted more writers or they were kind of upset that you guys were more performers and not poets what was the i think the person just felt overlooked and so i think that's really the top and bottom line of it yeah it's always a little bit of drama especially in a friendly family open mic scene like the poetry in las vegas has been for years but i went through the same thing vogue when i was i was one of the people who put together the poetry bridge along with gray crosby and the late great poet deborah cohn um and we tried to like do the big scope, but you're always going to leave people out because there's only so much space that they're giving you. So we had mm -hmm. traditional written poets like Aliki Barnstone, but then we also had drunk ass open mic poets like John Emmons on there. Oh, I was like, John. <laughs> yeah. So all these folks who were in different ways integral to the scene, mostly in Las Vegas, but also some Nevada poets, some academics, some coffee shop poets, and like I said, some drunk poets. <laughs> so we tried to have a nice smattering that really made Las Vegas, Las Vegas. Would you say that etching poetry into the sidewalks in Las Vegas, would you say that that's something innovative that we did? Definitely. I, I mean, I've never seen poetry in concrete before. So for me, that was like amazing. But I I mean, it wasn't even just that, too. Like, I got commissioned to put poetry on the mall directories at downtown Summerlin. So every quarter, there were two or three poems on display. So whenever the mall's, like, little directory thing would go, like, if you weren't touching it, it would revert to poetry. And so you could walk up <laughs> and be walking through the mall and see poems. And so that was amazing because the mall reached out to us. Like, we didn't say, oh, can we put poems on it? That was their idea. People are surprised that the government and the city and everybody does get involved in this stuff. We've had poetry on buses. We've had poetry on banners that hang on light posts up and down streets. I think there was a, a poetry truck that you were involved with, folk. Heather Lang put that together when she was Poet Laureate, and it was this big old advertising truck. It was illuminated, and it drove down the strip, it drove around downtown, and it drove out to Henderson, and it just displayed multiple people's poems. So the whole truck was up with a poem, and then after a while, mm. slideshow would go to the next poem. So there's my poem about taxes was on that thing. 
as opposed to what those trucks usually advertise going up and down the street. Right. Mm. Have naked folks mm -hmm. and come to the hotels and casinos. <laughs> I'd rather read your poems. <laughs> I think for sure for Vegas. And then I think our leadership, each time we get a different person in kind of a, a role, a leadership role, our, our scene changes and it becomes more inclusive and it becomes more innovative. Yeah, and we have to mention the Nevada Humanities as well. They've taken a, a deep interest in poetry in Las Vegas over the years. The Library District, the same thing. And so, yeah, these partnerships are out there creating these really more respected uh, form in our vastly um, weird entertainment scene or vastly weird literary scene uh, that is Las Vegas. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like the community is so focused on making poetry visible and accessible. And I feel like that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest steps to getting more people to come inside and join the community. From my experience working at Black Mountain Institute, which is a literary arts nonprofit out of UNLV, there was a very dedicated community around poetry and those regulars would always come out for the poetry events and I feel like Vegas does love our poetry scene. I'm wondering, has it always been that way? And has it always been a big scene? As long as I've been involved in the poetry scene, and we're talking around circa 1991 forward, it has been vibrant. I could go down such a, a hard and fast list of all the different venues that used to have regular poetry. And then there's these interesting little flashpoints along the way. Lollapalooza, when it was in Las Vegas in the mid-90s, it was the first stop was here at Sam Boyd Stadium. They had a poetry tent outside where traveling poets and, and local poets could kind of mix and compete. I entered into one of their contests. I got to go on stage and open up for the Beastie Boys with a poem. It did not go well, moving on. We've had <laughs> lots of these kind of things. There's been poetry on the Strip. Um, I've been involved in poetry programs on the Strip. Mm -hmm. Other local poets have. Places like the former Monte Carlo Cosmopolitan, just really wonderful. And then even recently at the... Uh, uh, at the Venetian, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda had a production that was in the big showroom over at the Venetian. And while it was a short run, it showed that, you know, poetry is a lot of different things and it could be really, really entertaining. And so I think Las Vegas, surprising to probably a lot of people with its city of 2.5 plus million people, is a poetry town in a lot of ways and has been for decades. Vogue, how about you? How have you seen the Las Vegas poetry scene grow or change? When I moved here in 2013, there was pretty much an open mic every night. And I started one that was on Thursdays with my homegirl. And we just, there was always something to do. That If you wanted to read poetry, there was always somewhere you could go. And there was always at least one in Henderson. So from 2017 to 2019, I was the poet laureate of Clark County. And in that role, it was really about combining these lists and making sure like we all knew when and where things were happening so that we could try to support each other as much as possible. And then from the loss of human experience, what, what came out of the fire was the jam that was started by uh, Jamila Wimberly. And that was at... They were at Hop Nuts and they were at Ninja Karaoke. And then they had like a special thing going on at the space that's strip adjacent. The campfire also <laughs> came out of that. And it's gone through, I think, three different names, but it's settled at being the campfire. And it happens right behind Rebar slash Davies. And that open mic has the closest energy, I think, to the human experience. And that's being a place that can be the first place that you ever read a poem at where the audience is like leaning into your every word. The host create an ambiance that really lets you know that the you need to respect the mic, which is mostly just means mm -hmm. shut up while the person is reading their poem. And and it's really well attended. I, I don't think I've been to one where there have been less than 50 people there. Yeah. And then we've got an entire slam scene. And I think the slam scene is the thing that's grown the most. And the poetry slams, the difference between a poetry slam and an open mic night is the poetry slam, people pick out five random human beings in the audience to judge the poems. Mm. And so you're going up and you're competing. Sometimes it's for money. Sometimes it's for bragging rights. Uh, either one. Oh, that sounds nerve wracking. Uh, it's definitely stressful. It's a very different vibe <laughs> between a poetry slam and an open mic poetry. They're both performance based, but poetry slam is over the top. So is it? <laughs> it can be. So it sounds like there's been a lot more slams coming up, but you guys also mention a lot of open mics and venues that aren't with us anymore. And I know building community is so important for the poetry scene. So with 
Las Vegas being such a transient city and so many people are coming in and out, organizers are leaving all the time. Is it harder to build community around poetry here? Well, is it hard to build any community in Las Vegas because of the transient nature? Poetry is not immune to it. Uh, some great poetry readings and series have disappeared because people disappear, yeah. but also because businesses close down and then people scramble like turtles to find a new shell and they don't all fit right. Yeah. So my, my husband, AJ, used to host a four hour open mic. <laughs> <laughs> oh my at a venue. god! Wow. Right, God bless him. <laughs> it was like a variety show of shenanigans. But of course, like once you lose that venue, you have to build a relationship. So we have we've had slams at Public Us, uh, and they housed the slam for two years. The oh my gosh, what is it called? Grouchy Johns used to host open mics as well, and it was while they could. But even they've had to scale back their businesses. So I think. Some of it has to do with industry. Some some of it has to do with people moving. But the beauty the, the beauty about poetry reading is it's pretty easy to just kind of mount it and make it happen when you do need a new venue. And even if you lose people, you still have interest. I mean, I've done hosted poetry readings at the Double Down Saloon of all places. Yeah. And it worked. There are the places where it doesn't work. And you're like, okay, that was a good try. And we move on. Um, I, that's just the nature of Las Vegas. Because it is transient, you're always adapting. Poetry has done pretty well. I mean, it's mm -hmm. apparently been around around for uh, at least 100 years in the world. You are so funny. Maybe maybe older. And I think that says something about Las Vegas that, yes, these things are closing down, things change, people move, but there's always someone right there to pick up that slack, to open a new venue, to start a new open mic or slam event. So I think that says something about Vegas's dedication to poetry and why we are mm -hmm. such a big poetry city. So if the transiency is maybe the worst thing about poetry in Las Vegas. What is the best thing about poetry in Las Vegas? I want to start because you're going to be more thoughtful than I am, folks. <laughs> uh, and so what I want to just say is that it, it's just become a respectful medium for expression in this community, and it's important, and it hasn't always been that way. And the very, very quick story that I really want to tell is that in 1970, the governor of Nevada appointed the Poet Laureate for the whole state, he picked a lounge singer from Las Vegas, of all people, mm. uh, because he liked his zippy little tunes that he did as he performed on the strip. It was a guy named Norman Kay. And he remained Nevada's Poet Laureate for 37 years. Painful. And when wow. the Nevada Arts Council is like, OK, Norman, that was nice. You haven't actually written a poem or done anything as a Poet Laureate. And we do have this scene now. We want to draw people from it. He refused. He did a, like a, a publicity campaign, and it even showed up all over the country. Like, they're trying to stop the lounge singer in Las Vegas, and it was like a big goof. Eventually, he passed away, and now we've kind of come around <laughs> with Gail Marie. And it really is, to me, a funny story that reflects that Las Vegas has come around, and it is an important thing in our community. And I think it's going to last for a long time. I think it's the access to different poets who are leading workshops, and it might be somebody that you really want to get to know or someone whose work you admire, and it's it's not that hard to find them leading a workshop, or it's not that hard to hit them up and be like, hey, can I ask you a question about this? So I think the dedication to education and growth mm. in the Valley is, is like the biggest thing. That makes me have a whole new appreciation for poetry in our city, and before we close, I want to give you both the opportunity to read your poems that Las Vegans can find on the Poetry Bridge or walking down the street downtown and give the location of this poem on the sidewalk. All right. So this is just also an excerpt. And this is in the uh, Poet Bridge next to the Fifth Street Schoolhouse. Here we go. And beyond our mountains lies the land of clocks. All the people here come from there. No one intervenes because it might be them. No matter where they came from, they belong here. Ooh, was that a Las Vegas baseball? Yes. Nice. I like it. I like it. I've been told, because I've seen everybody else's poem but mine, <laughs> that this portion of my poem is located somewhere near Third and Gas. And so, yeah, here we go. I write to clear the cobwebs from the fragile surfaces on my mind. To remember how hope feels. For friends unafraid of creating another family and accepting me in it. For the woman I will one day become. All right. Well, thank you, Vogue and David, for sharing your poetry with us and celebrating the end of Poetry Month on CityCast Las Vegas. Thanks, Layla. Yes. The month doesn't have to end. Write poems all year long. Oh. 
Now let's get into a little news. Between today and Sunday, Lake Mead is expected to rise about a foot. Water bosses will gush that water from Lake Powell for experimental purposes, something about moving sediment, with a few more feet set to arrive by late May. But let's wait a second before we get too excited, y'all. The water won't exceed the amount Lake Mead was supposed to get anyway in 2023. Also on Monday, Desert Tortoise Mojave Max finally woke up after a historically long hibernation. Now that spring has officially sprung, someone get that tortoise a mimosa. That's all today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, tell a friend. You can also support us by rating the show, leaving us a review, and subscribing to our morning newsletter, Hey Las Vegas. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye, y'all. I'm doing words. I'm doing words, Sam. I'm putting my old poetry beret back on. Right. I was like, wow, Layla, I'm so sorry that this is the version of us you're getting today. It's like, oh, no, we have to put our poet hats on and it's about to get real floral. Yes, it's OK. <laughs> I, I asked for the poets and I got the poets.